Okay, so normally in Legend of Zelda games, right, you play as a little forest guy named Link and go on an adventure where you fight a evil dude, usually named Ganon, and you often team up with a magic princess named Zelda. Del, Del, Del. Ah, my video isn't rendering properly because my computer's RAM is being gunked up by other web browsers. Go Chrome! Ah, Mr. Spacer Man, you should have been using today's sponsor, Opera GX. Are you referring to the browser with features such as GX Control that let me control how many resources my browser is using for optimal performance without having to close all my tabs? Exactly, look at how many tabs I have opened. Spaghetti, Bugatti, Stromboli, Paganini. That sounds super awesome, but I'm also tired of the look of my regular boring old browser. Ah, have you seen the GX mods? Wait, are you talking about how in the GX store you can select all sorts of different themes which change things like the background music, keyboard sounds, opening and closing tab sounds, browser theme and colors, wallpaper, which are simple to enable and disable on the mod sidebar? Pizza pasta! I get it, those look amazing, but when I'm looking for a new web browser, what I really need is a browser for gamers. Ah, have you seen it at GX Corner? Whoa, is this a spot that lets me stay up to date on the newest game releases, latest gaming news, and great deals all in one convenient place? Like 62% off on Risk of Rain 2 and completely free games like the survival management game Symmetry? Because if so, that's dope. But switching browsers is such a pain. All of my most visited sites, which I will not be showing, are all bookmarked on my old browser. Quick import. Oh snap, I can easily transfer over my old settings like bookmarks and cookies to Opera GX. That's incredible. This sounds incredible to you too. Download Opera GX for free using the link in the description below. And thanks again to Opera GX for sponsoring today's video. We gotta take a quick detour before we get started. I remember playing Super Mario Galaxy 1 on the Wii in like 2008, and I was like, dang, this is a really good game. It's got Mario, a wide variety of levels, great music, Rosalina, a big empty observatory. It's cool. Then two years later, 2010, Mario Galaxy 2 came out, and holy shit, this is a good game. It's got better levels, Yoshi, better music, Yoshi, a better, denser hub world where you collect other peoples like a Christopher Columbus. Wait, what the fuck? Yoshi, the throw it back galaxy, Yoshi. You remember the first game that was, and still is, awesome? Well, this sequel makes that first game look like Donkey Kong doo-doo by comparison. Fast forward to 2011. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword on the Wii came out and look, it's not a complete piece of garbage. There are some good things going for it. It's like one third good game, two thirds. What the fuck is this stupid ass, tedious, repetitive bullshit? Leave me alone! It's not the worst game I've ever played, but it was the first time I was truly disappointed by a video game. This was when I was in college, and my across the hall friend was playing a little game known as Skyrim at the same time, and he'd be all like, man, Skyrim is so cool with so much to do. Oh, but uh, how's your little Zelda game going? And I had to be like, uh, uh, the Kalactos boss fight is really good. <laughs> There's a lot of revisionist history behind Skyward Sword, especially because the Switch version allegedly improved a lot of stuff. And you look at review scores from the time, they look pretty good. But watch the actual review. The story always remains the same, and with few side quests to flesh out the universe, it can sometimes feel like going through the motions. A champion of stating the obvious, she's not particularly helpful. For as advanced as the level design is, there are other elements in need of an overhaul. Skyward Sword stumbles out of the blocks with some of the game's most uninteresting and confusing dungeon design. All the frivolity has been purged taking some of the charm along with it. Skyward Sword can feel a little creaky when it comes to long distance traversal. You're given dowsing abilities. It's boring, too vague, and a much bigger part of the gameplay than it should be. When compared to prior Zelda games, the overall variety is lacking. It's gorgeous one moment, and garish the next. The environments are barren, and the lone town has less than 20 citizens. It looks like an old game. While the harp is a total bust from a gameplay perspective, it's easily the most cinematic game in the series, yet it's still behind the curve. Minus a couple ear stabbers, it's great stuff. Voice acting is absent once again in favor of gibberish grunts and giggles. It's only made worse by some of the flappy jaw animations. It's Zelda's 25th anniversary, and Skyward Sword represents its first gray hairs. Damn, he fucking hates this shit. What the fuck? 
it is a little something for everyone. Even the makers of Zelda knew that the 3D Zelda formula after five games, maybe it was getting a little stale. So what do they do for the next game? They made it more like Skyrim. I never made any sort of review on Breath of the Wild since I didn't have much of a YouTube channel back then, but I absolutely loved it. It was a vast departure from the tired 3D Zelda formula, but still captured the spirit of adventure at the heart of the series. It's not a perfect game because there is no perfect game, except maybe you, but it is a certified masterpiece and we all agree! I played it right at launch six years ago on the Switch, all the way through, did all 120 shrines, nope, 132 shrines with the Champion's Ballad DLC, I did not find all the Korok seeds because you are not supposed to do that. And since playing that first year, I haven't touched it since, nor have I wanted to. I was full like after a Thanksgiving dinner. And a lot of the fun for me was experiencing the landscape and locales of this new open world Hyrule for the first time. So what happened six years later in the game's direct sequel, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom? The start of the game. For reference, Breath of the Wild has the perfect start to a video game. The Great Plateau is an extremely effective microcosm of the full game, introducing a new generation of players to Zelda while simultaneously rewiring the brains of longtime Zelda fans to this new style and all its new mechanics. You finish the first shrine, then the game is like, I figure it out, but secretly guides you through clever placement of its mechanics and non-intrusive tutorials. But if you wanted more direct instruction, you can get that by talking to Ronald Reagan over here. Look, I don't want to get too into this, some guy who's incredibly smart and cool and funny already made an award winning video about it, but this is how you start a video game. By contrast, Tears of the Kingdom cold opens with a much slower start, Breath of the Wild, you wake up naked and you go, Tears of the Kingdom, we're walking. I'll say it since everyone else is scared too, this tunnel section kind of sucks ass. This is not how you start a video game, especially when it's the same scene we have seen in multiple trailers for the past four years, come on. It's paced like one of those boring trailing missions in an Ass Creed game where you walk very slowly for a really long time while Zelda spouts exposition. I've always been a huge proponent of gameplay over cutscene, interactive over passive when it comes to video games, and it does have a nice payoff at the very end of the game I won't spoil, but in this one specific instance, maybe this whole section would have been better as a quick cutscene. But the advantage of it being gameplay is we get to see this ain't just any old Link, this is Champion Link after the events of the previous game. Pile Driver of the Calamity put some respect on his name. Look at all Adam Hearts, already got the Master Sword, probably returned to his lore accurate strength level, and I'm about to get Metroided, aren't I? God damn it, Link is why you bring a fucking shield! And then the game starts for real, and it's kinda familiar to the last game. Guys, as long as we have the Master Sword, we're fine. Alright, not gonna need that. The Great Plateau in Breath of the Wild was very much figure it out, dumbass, since all its mechanics are gameplayally intuitive, and by that I mean you can play the game and gradually figure everything out. Many of its systems match up with real life nature. However, Tears of the Kingdom is more, there is shit we need to teach you or else you will be lost. You can skip and sequence break to an extent, but there definitely is more of an intended order to everything on the Sky Islands. Go into this cave, here's what the Bright Bloom Seeds do, here's what Zonite does, follow these minecart rails. Just just by nature of it being islands instead of a landmass, your initial freedom is much more limited. So instead you play through The Legend of Zelda Furry Awakening, where you gain abilities from four shrines while the ghost of a king teaches you the mechanics. Does this sound familiar? Also, I forgot how shiny these games are, especially in the sky during daytime. I'm playing this game with a visor on, I still can't see a goddamn thing up here. But while the beginning of a game sets the tone and player expectations, and I did not enjoy the opening section nearly as much as The Great Plateau, you can speed through this tutorial section in a couple hours. It's not a big deal. You know, had it been me, I would have cold open with Link waking up with a new arm and broken Master Sword. Then flash back to the tunnel cutscene after finishing the Sky Islands to get that earned exposition moment. Then the game is like, alright, you did it, you're done, go to Hyrule. And at the time I thought I'd missed the paraglider, but my whole stream chat was like, jump, jump, jump. I think you should jump. Diving down to the surface for the first time, seeing the broad scope of the game world, Hyrule and all its excellence, all these places you'll go to and explore. Then the music, the piano is all like, the woodwinds fluttering about like, and then the brass comes in like, you see this? Now this is how I make a fucking video game. 
real game begins, for real this time. I've played every Zelda game except for the ones I have not played, and I'm here to tell you that this is the best Zelda game. I think people were expecting this game to be the Majora's Mask to Breath of the Wild's Ocarina of Time, especially after the dark initial reveal trailer with the <laughs> distorted vocals, and it's somewhere between that and a really good ROM hack of Ocarina Master Quest, and this metaphor was falling apart. But after years of waiting and not even knowing the game's title and finally playing the game, dang, they weren't kidding. They really could. Sequel to Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. You're traveling across Hyrule. Again, you're visiting map towers. Again, you're doing shrines. Again, you're finding Koroks. Again, you're finding memories. Again, if you didn't jive with Butwa, you're probably not gonna jive with Totka. If you're not a fan of bargain blowjobs, you're probably not gonna enjoy the Turbo Twister Snake Eater Gl Gl 4000. Is more of one of the most critically acclaimed games in human history, along with a dump truck fleet of brand new mechanics and discoveries backing that ass up, along with an Appalachian avalanche of advancements and improvements elevating the return of mechanics of the previous highly experimental game necessarily a bad thing? No, I don't think so. I think it's a great thing, actually. Would I prefer to be exploring a brand new world instead of the same Hyrule from the last game? Yes, of course. But the rare thing that can be done with sequels is exploring the same world and seeing how things have changed. Like with a Kanto Pokemon game, then retraveling Kanto in a Johto Pokemon game that takes place a few years later. Or like Pokemon Black 1 and Pokemon Black 2. Or even like Zelda Ocarina's Child World and Adult World. The entire area has been remixed. It's like seeing an old friend again. You grew up seeing each other every day in school. Now six years later, they're catching up on a vacation together, only hitting the highlights. They got a sick new tattoo. They've gotten into DIY. They go to very special conventions now. Good for them. Their wife redecorated their home and threw out all their stuff. Holy shit, you have a kid now? The general layout of the main quest is similar to Breath of the Wild, similar to Majora's Mask, where you go to the four regions of Hyrule that are uh, fucked up, and you unfuck uh, it by clearing a dungeon. Yunobo is a pimp and the Gorons are addicted to crack? Why did this plan work so well? Given that a lot of my fun of Breath of the Wild was exploring Hyrule for the first time and seeing all these locations, how can they possibly recreate that magic while exploring the same world as the last game? by making a sandwich. They added a whole top layer of sky islands, and by layer I mean like a handful of islands, and an entire bottom layer of the map beneath the surface, that's the depths, full of gloom, which takes your hearts away if you roll around in it too much or get whacked too many times. I like this mechanic, it reminds me of old school dungeon crawling where you want to see how far you can dive into mystery and collect rewards without running out of resources. You walk around in complete darkness until you find a light route, which is always directly underneath a surface shrine and it's the shrine name backwards. This took me an embarrassingly long time to figure out. But the good news is that you can use the shrines to find the light roots and vice versa. Its aesthetic reminds me of the upside down from Stranger Things. And it's a cool way to do the whole light world dark world parallel like in some previous Zelda games. Although I wish there was a little bit more variety in the depths. Come visit Hyrule, we have it all. North Carolina, West Virginia, Texas, Florida, California, Ohio, Waffle house. The map sandwich that they made was also a Swiss cheese sandwich because there are a ton of caves in Hyrule now. Some caves are long, some are pretty short, and let me tell you, I did not enjoy finding the entrances to some of these caves. I turned the shrine sensor off because I did not want to hear boop, 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 the whole game, but later in the game I turn it back on, follow the sensor, only to arrive and learn you have arrived at the shrine that is directly below you in a cave a mile away. Cool! Thank you shrine sensor! Is this thing powered by fucking ways? You arrive at a Sheikah Tower. Nope, Skyview Tower. Ready to activate it. But the entrance is blocked or doesn't work. These towers are very poorly built by the way. No construction standards. And you need to find a cave nearby and ascend into it. Okay, seems easy enough. But I don't know if it's a skill issue or a my eyeball issue or the lighting on my TV issue. But it would take me like an hour to find the entrance to some of these caves. I'd even walk right by it multiple times and still be lost. Ah, but Mr. Spaceman, the bloopies run 
towards the caves. They ain't there all the time. Ah, but you can go to the cherry blossom tree and Satoru Iwata will tell you where the local caves are. All right, well, let me ask you this. Where is the cherry tree? I'm in the tundra. Anyways, while you perform some of the same general tasks as Breath of the Wild, there's much better context for your actions here. For example, first game, you unlock each great fairy by dumping a bank load of rupees. Sure, play the game, explore and find stuff, sell it for rupees, get your reward. Second game, you instead do this multi-part side quest where you help Victorian Wario recruit musicians and build different machines to transport them to the Great Fairy. A much more memorable experience than insert cash or select payment type. I do understand people's criticisms about the lack of musical themes, especially when a lot of the music is the exact same song as Breath of the Wild. I'm glad there's no true overworld theme because it would get repetitive, but you'd think in the sequel they would layer a new instrument on top or add a B section, but no, there's the sad version that plays when you arrive, then after you unfuck the place, it's the happy version from Breath of the Wild again. There's awesome saxophone in the trailer, but only subtle saxophone in the actual game? What have you done with Kenny G? Instead, most of the soundtrack once again takes the more minimalist approach, with environmental noises and short little musical cues that help set the scene. The ground has piano, the depths have <laughs> and the sky has woodwinds. It matches the peaceful sky gameplay, it's relaxing. This ain't fucking Xenoblade, alright? The game shuts the hell up sometimes, and it's nice. Not that you need external stimulants to fully engage your brain while playing, but this is a good listen to an audio book or podcast while playing type of game. I personally caught up on episodes of some more news. Those guys are funny. What do you do in the game? All the old new mechanics introduced in Breath of the Wild that are reminiscent of survival games return. The game again features open world exploration. Unlike many open worlds that are big and empty, in Breath and Tears you can spin around 360 degrees anywhere on the map and see multiple points of interest and the anticipation builds as you approach. You can climb anything. You navigate with a tablet, stamina wheel for sprinting and climbing, bullet time arrows while midair, dedicated jump button, there's different temperature effects, sound meter for sneaking around, foraging for flora and fauna, cooking meals for special buffs, different outfits with different abilities. This is by far the sluttiest link yet, and I'm here for it. Waste more snatched than a weave inside of a purse in West Hollywood. And are those tassels? Whore! You gather all sorts of different weapons, there are different melee weapon types, weapons still break, and you gotta pick up more. I did not mind weapon durability in Breath of the Wild, and I don't mind it here. And you wanna know why? Because I'm not a fucking baby, all right? I'm done having this discussion. If you're still acting upset about this six years later, you're acting like a fucking baby and you need to grow up. Where, where, my weapon broke. Look around you, look at the floor, you just got three more. Where, where, I don't wanna use my cool flame sword because it's gonna break. The game scales. You kill more enemies, the enemy gets cool weapons, you get a cool new weapon. Maybe you use your more disposable weapons for simple battles and use your best weapons for harder ones. God forbid the game have mechanics that the player has to account for while playing. Even though you are playing as Champion Link, one podium he will not be on is the 100 meter dash because I forgot how turtle slow this Link is. Granted, the most recent Zelda game I replayed before this one was Wind Waker where you can spin dash around each board, but this open world Link did not eat his Wheaties. Speed boost speed should maybe be the default speed, but you cannot combine speed food buffs with other food buffs because the developers of this game will not see heaven, so you're just slow. Tears does treat the player as if they're familiar with breath, which I'm willing to bet is most of the player base, so the tutorial breezes through most of the returning stuff or makes it completely optional by talking to the Roomba robots. It'd be interesting to hear from players who skipped breath and started with tears if learning all the old stuff plus all the new stuff was overwhelming, or if it was paced out well. New stuff. The Sheikah Slate and its four main abilities are gone, replaced by the legally distinct Purapad, which does sound like a Kakariko tampon brand, but this is why I was talking about Mario Galaxy 1 and 2, because while the Sheikah Slate X-Men powers were cool, the new abilities make those old ones look quaint by comparison. What the hell even was Cryonis? Like, be for real right now. Ultra Hand. This is your bread and butter ability that replaces Magnesis, in the same way that David Tennant replaced Dark Elf Man on Doctor Who. Oh, you can move specific metal objects? Oh, that's really cute, Magneto. Mega Hand moves everything, and it can melt to anything to anything. I remember seeing the gameplay demo and for the first time in decades, my left brain and my right brain finally talked to each other to think of all the different things I can build. All right, let's put my engineering degree to work. Check this out. I made a, li a little car. 
Then I went online and saw these people making actual Gundams. So back to the workbench and made a bigger car and a beach cruiser. A fun little plane, I thought that was pretty cool. You got rewind, nope, recall, to replace stasis. It lets you rewind time on a single object, then stop at mid movement wherever you want. There's a little pause before it activates too, so you can easily hop on whenever you're rewinding. This helps a lot with flying machine takeoff. The range on this is ridiculous, probably for all the times when you mess up J.O. Crystal Delivery Shrines, which, <laughs> which never happened to me, why do you ask? Ascend lets you no clip through any surface above you within range. This works anywhere and on anything. You can even ascend out of the depths and onto the surface. Rewind and Ascend are two of the most broken abilities in gaming history. Luckily, this is balanced by the fact that you will forget you have them all the time. If you get stuck on a puzzle, chances are you need to rewind or ascend. Fuse. You can duct tape any item onto a weapon or onto an arrowhead, giving it an attack boost, and many objects have special abilities. You do not need to randomly find a fire sword or fire arrows in this game. You simply make them yourself whenever you want by exploring and fusing. Then venture out and serve up some piping hot ass whoopings. Remember Cryonis? No? Well, you can just do that with a fused ice weapon. Also, you will never need to do that. And this brings me to the combat. Booty of the Wild gave you a million different ways to approach enemy encounters, and Thoughts of the Kingdom expands that to give you a million squared ways, a quad million ways. All the repeat items and new items you can fuse to your weapons with so many special abilities. You got puff shrooms to make a smoke screen and then sneak strike everyone, like a Batman. You can use a muddle bud to cast berserk on enemies to make them all fight each other for you. The bomb rune is gone, thank you for your service, but now there are bomb flowers which you can make bomb arrows like in this game and blow up everyone from a distance like you're the sparky sparky boom man from that one episode of Avatar. You can fuse a weapon to a weapon to make a longer stronger weapon. It clips through the floor, who gives a shit? Fusing also gives the weapon durability a little boosty. So maybe Maybe now all those whining durability babies will shut the fuck up. The fusion system and special properties also improves the game's resource economy. Wild booty, fight enemies, you lose current weapons, gain replacements. Often you won't have space for all the new weapons. What do you earn from enemies? Monster parts that you can cook elixirs with? Sell for money? Not super compelling. So players would often just skip battles if they were worried about using up their best weapons. Tier kings, all the old stuff is still there, but on top of that, you can fuse new weapons to existing ones, earn monster parts to enhance weapons. You're much more likely to do the combats because you want the materials to do cool stuff. Last game, keys are annoying and useless and stupid. New game, I'm actively looking for more keys to organ harvest because their body parts are so useful for arrow fusing. Every weapon you find is now viable, even weak ones, because you can attach the horn of the monster you just beat to a shitty club to make a good club. I've heard a few people say that the combat in this game is boring? What? I will say that compared to games like Monster Hunter and FromSoft games, the combat is simpler since this game has a more general target audience than those ones, but I wouldn't call it boring. Simple does not mean boring. Those are two different axes on the chart. Mario Kart is simple compared to other driving games, but I wouldn't call it boring unless you're as good as me who has zero chance of losing. And while it would be pretty sick nasty if we had access to some of those anime finisher moves like Age of Calamity had, I still wouldn't say that it's boring. There are those excellent videos you can see of hyper elite players role playing as lore accurate Link, but I don't think a game's feature should be judged by what the top 3.4% of players can achieve, but instead by what the average skill level player can do. And the average skill level player has easy access to all of these different options. Melee attacks with different attack patterns for different weapons, shield parrying, perfect dodges, long range keys battles to snipe them from a grassy knoll, sneak attacks like Metal Gear Solid, hit and run like the Simpsons, inflicting god dang JRPG status conditions like burn, freeze, paralysis, blind, daze, confuse, and you can build various Zonai mecha to gun them down. To be fair, some of the most fun I had with this game's combat was near the start, running around high level areas with only 4 hearts. In the mid and late game you quickly become so powerful and can cook so many meals that you basically have no chance of dying as long as you're paying attention and not getting one hit killed by anyone. The combat was still fun though. 
I'm willing to bet the combat is boring crowd probably use simple melee swings for like 90% of the game. And yeah, if the game gives you a billion options and you pick the same one or two every time, it would get boring. If you go to Cheesecake Factory with its Kama Sutra sized menu and you pick the spaghetti 20 times in a row, then yeah, it would get pretty repetitive, you dumb bitch. Zonai devices. Tatka has around 25 to 30 simple machines, but not those simple machines, that you can meld together with Ultra Hand. And in true caveman scientist fashion, whack it with a club to turn them all on. You'll find a lot of free ones laying around in the overworld, encouraging the player to use them. You can also use the big capsule machines in the sky to get portable devices that you can deploy at any time. Gotcha games are the devil, and they should stop being made for the rest of human existence. So seeing this machine in the trailer activated my fight or flight. However, this is not gotcha. This is pick which things you want and you get them. I think it's good that we can't store the ones laying around in the overworld for future capsule deployment, because we all know that we would pick up every single one and never use them, like they're a mega elixir in a JRPG. Sure, it's the final boss, but what if I need it later? Quick build lets you store any previous creation and deploy it at any time. Not just Zona devices too, but any object you recently ultra fisted. Even if you don't have the materials nearby, you can spend magic rocks to conjure it out of thin air. All these mechanics running at the same time, and especially when the game applies a dynamic filter over the game world, or when you make complex interconnected machines that the game has to run physics calculations for, the resolution of the game does take a hit, drawing criticism from some gamers, primarily owners of higher end consoles or PC. I had to say it before from Monster Hunter, and I'll say it again here. I'm sorry that the portable gaming console that's the size of a fucking Nintendo DS can't run 32K, 200 FPS, display 8,000 penis floops of resolution, injecting graphical smegma straight into your dickhole. Graphics on little console will not be as good as graphics on big console. Games did not need to look much better than the GameCube anyways. PS4 and PS5 are the same system, one just has faster load times. But, but, but it doesn't have ray tracing. Yeah, 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 why don't you go ray trace some bitches? Instead, Tears of the King utilizes the Switch's limited processing power to pump the brakes on the graphical fidelity while going full speed ahead on fun gameplay mechanics. And it's amazing that the six year old console doesn't crash or explode. Games should do less of this realistic puddle texture took a thousand man hours to make and instead use processing power towards cool immersive mechanics. Video games are meant to be played, interacted with, not simply looked at and jerked off to. Anyways, uh, I like that Central Hyrule is more or less your hub now, since in the last game, most players probably did not spend a lot of time in Central Hyrule, given that Central Hyrule was, well, you know. Speaking of, your rogues gallery. A big criticism of Buttwall was the lack of enemy variety, and I agree. Here's a list of enemies from the last game, and here's a list with all the new ones. Many of the new enemies are really cool, like the Zonai Wally fighters that use Zonai devices against you. The Zonai Rubik's Cube Megazord mini bosses use all sorts of different attack patterns, and you can use your hand abilities to counter a lot of their attacks. Guardians were exclusive to breath and all of their variations are gone, other than that one guardian husk on the roof of the lab. In both games, the enemy difficulty gradually scales with how much stuff you do, and it feels like in tears, especially with the guardians gone, the power levels of regular enemies scaled faster, and I was fighting black and silver enemies much more earlier and much more frequently. However, I could just be misremembering. Common enemies now have different horns in addition to color rankings, which I think is great for both crafting and for accessibility, since it'll be easier for colorblind players to tell which is which. Although, I would not be surprised if this was not done on purpose for that reason, because this is Nintendo we're talking about. The increased enemy variety is great, and returning enemies have new attack patterns or abilities. Like sometimes you'll have to fight an enemy with armor and have to blast off the armor before you can do real damage. Boss Bokoblins organize their troops to attack together. I like how with some of the new enemies, you have to do more than just hit them with your sword until they're more dead than F-Zero. However, many of the enemies are biome based, like Gibdos in the desert, or Riblays in the cave, etc. So you may go long stretches running into the same handful of guys over and over. And while the new enemies are great, it still feels lacking when there's such a large world, but you see the same infantry types fairly often. Would also be nice if they brought back more enemies closer to the Lionel strength tier, like Dark Nuts, Iron Knuckles, actual Stalfos. Since Guardians are gone, instead the big roaming threat that are way less frequent, but way more terrifying are gloom hands. Guardians you could usually see from a distance and mentally prepare for them, plus they telegraph their attacks. But gloom hands, you'll be minding your own business, and they literally show up out of nowhere to 
sky turns red, the creepy reverse Barbara Streisand vocals come in, their haunted hands start grabbing you, reducing your hearts. When I'd encounter them, I'd usually run away, but they are also very fast and Link is not. It's very satisfying to be able to fight one off or completely defeat the entire palm. God, fuck that guy. Wait, why does this screen say Phantom Ganon? Why does the screen say Phantom Ganon? The sword that seals the darkness, the blade of evil's bane, the revitalized sword of legend! Oh yeah, that's cool. I'm gonna use mine as like a pickaxe for the next 40 hours. Design Theory, aka I don't know what to title this section. Even if this game ain't your jam, you gotta give it some props. Big open world with plenty of crap in it. Huge draw distance, gorgeous stylized graphics, intertwining physics calculations, shorter load times while fast traveling the Breath of the Wild, near seamless transitions between the sky, the ground, and the depths. And all of this running on the Switch's easy bake oven processor without going nuclear? Where Breath of the Wild was all about chemistry, Tears of the Kingdom is more about physics. Real world game devs were impressed by just how well the game's physics system functions. Um, do physics work just like real life? That's not very impressive. That's exactly why it's impressive! No, 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 go open up Unity, make a new project, try to make half this shit work without any issues and get back to me. But what if... I just lied. What if Tears doesn't actually follow real world physics, but instead follows player intent? I remember being on the Great Sky Island, I wanted to, you know, show off on stream and put some extra fans on my log boat, but one of the fans was slightly off center, so my boat just careened to the side. I remember thinking, oh my god, is the whole game gonna be this anal about my building? And I'm happy to report the answer is no, that was the only time. For example, the rockets. If you have a powerful force like this that isn't tangent to the body center, a mass, it's gonna create a moment and spin around instead. However, the game goes, oh you attached a rocket, so you wanna do a blast off? We'll do a blast off. It's not so much real world physics as much as it is the average player's perception of real world physics and how they think the object should interact. I mean, sometimes your vehicle might pull to the left a little, but it's all usable. The fact that more often than not, your creations do what you want them to do, or if they don't, it's really funny. And the fact that you don't need a master's in physics or engineering to make things work is a testament to the level of skilled technical craftsmanship and polish put into this game. For those unaware, this game was more or less complete in spring of 2022, but they decided to delay it anyways by a year for extra testing to make sure everything functions nearly to perfection. While it's absolutely fantastic that the Zelda team and Nintendo decided to spend that extra time, especially in today's era of broken, buggy, unfinished game releases, I think it's also important to remember that most small and medium-sized companies cannot afford to delay their game by a year just for extra polish. We're talking an additional several million dollars of development cost. However, the Pokemon Company absolutely can afford to delay their games though, Jesus fucking Christ. Koroks are back. You collect their nut to trade in for inventory expansion. In addition to the quick little 10 second puzzles like in the last game, there's also a fun new type of puzzle where all you gotta do is transport Dora the Explorer to their fellow backpack buddy, and then you get two poops for doing it. Some of them you can just pick them up and walk them over, but it's way more fun to build some type of machine to transport them over. Once again, feeding into this game's open ended solution style. I did not torture or crucify the Koroks because I do not like to roleplay as a Neon Genesis sociopath. What is wrong with you people? But I did accidentally launch the uh, Korok space program. Okay, we gotta get little buddy from down there to up there. The future of Hyrule depends on it. Let's go. Prop that bad boy up. Vision control. Run the calculations. You're gonna need some rockets. We gonna need some rockets. 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 Yeah, I'm thinking more rockets. Rockets, 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 rockets. Hello, good morning. Don't mind me, you know, just an average day. Flippin' weirdo. Mission Control, we clear to launch. We're Plateau Station, you are clear to launch. Three, two, one, go, go, go. We have liftoff. We did it, y'all. Mission success. We have liftoff. We have, oh, fuck. Wait, wait. Wait, hang on, hang on, hang on, wait, hang on, wait, hang on. Mission accomplished, baby! Mission complete! Mission complete! Congratulations! 
Wow. Last game, to explore, you're climbing from the bottom up. New game, to explore, you're dropping in from the top down. You barely have to climb in this game. This new approach does help Tears' play experience feel wholly unique from that of Breath, despite the very similar worlds. Most redundant mechanics are gone. Revali's Gale, you got at least five different ways to do that whenever you want. There are no elemental weapons or arrows because you can make them yourself. Horses are still in the game because people like horses. But why would I use a horse when I can manifest a car or a flying motorcycle whenever I want? I used the horse for a while, but the horses are, you know. All right, horse, come over here. Come on, turn, nope, gotta dismount, pick up an item, then run back, whistle for the horse. Now go over there, nope, go over there. Okay, you know what, horsey? You're just gonna stay in in the middle of Tano Village for the rest of the game. Bye bye To get some of the cool outfits, you don't need to find a random DLC chest in a river like in Breath. You have to fight a boss in the sky, which leads to a treasure map in the depths, which leads to a cool pair of pants. Resource connections are spread across all three layers of the map to encourage the player to change locales and keep things from getting stale. You collect sky flowers in the sky to heal your corrupted wounds in the depths. Only the heavenly energy of the past can fight off the temptation of hell. Golden apples, the forbidden fruit of knowledge. Gift from the gods. Zonai descended from heaven. Raru, the first king, like a god sent from heaven. Worshipped out of love or out of fear? Did they lead Hyrule or subjugate it? Raru and Minoru, the last two Zonai. Why? Did the real people of Hyrule rebel against their oppressors? Zonai had an intermixed species to keep them dying out. The father, the son, the holy spirit. Din, Nehru, Foror, were they Zonai before they were Dinral, Nadra, and Farosh? The Triforce, the holy trinity, gone from this world. The Zaddy, the Twinkie, the holy woman, she would beat you suddenly. Ganondorf using Zonai magical secret stone to sow discord, corrupted by Ganondorf to corrupt Hyrule like Lucifer, the fallen angel, secret stones or kidney stones, kidney beans, keeping people alive. How many dead because of tampering with God's power? How many mortal deaths are on Raru's fluffy fingers? That power wasn't meant for mortals. Raru's arm has the power to alter reality itself. The depths, Ganon's domain, dangerous location, lots of power for those who seek it. The fallen soldiers bestowing powerful weapons, their lingering will to defeat evil, pose the lost souls in a route to the afterlife, bargainers outside the laws of good and evil, granting power in exchange for souls, the temptation of hell's riches, seven deadly sins, seven deadly sages, god powers versus god powers. Would any of this had happened if the Zonai never descended upon Hyrule in the first place? Which brings me to the central theme of this game, which is religion is bad. Wait, hang on! Shrine and puzzle design, flashback, I did all the shrines in Breathwild, and for most of them, I would forget what I did as soon as I was finished. The game gave you a puzzle with a clear intended solution, and you would use your Sheikah Slate runes, sword, and bow to solve it. The few ones I didn't remember were the ones where I used an unintended, sometimes accidental solution to solve it because it was really funny. However, Tears of the Queefdom is the ultimate water cooler game. It borrows design philosophy from the immersive sim genre and lets you approach its challenges in any way you can. Fans of immersive sims probably would not call Zelda an immersive sim, because people actually played this game. In the tutorial island, you gotta ride the rails, but the rails are broken in one spot. I melded a couple carts together, but there were still hooks around like I was in a pirate's wardrobe. I thought, do I need to use the hook too? And a viewer in my stream chat said it best. For the solution you chose, no you don't. Previous Zelda games, here's a puzzle, find our solution. Tears of the Kingdom, here's the situation, create your own solution. Oh, there's two guys now, that's how you know it's Breath of the Wild 2. Let's sort the shrines into categories. And I'm gonna preface this with saying, I currently I currently have not done every shrine. I did about 110 before fighting the final boss, and I did a handful more while getting footage for this video, but I'll assume the 30 or so I haven't done are kind of similar to the others and are not complete garbage. There's tutorial shrines, which I only remember there being one in breath, but here there's multiple, most of them for different combat techniques. Given that you start in central Hyrule, you'd think the tutorials would be more in the middle and more challenging shrines would be further out, but nope, they seemingly randomly assign them. At one point, you're in like the corner of the map and the game goes, here's how to do the sneak strike, like 50 hours in. Combat shrines return, but instead of them being major tests of strength where you fight different flavors of the same dude 20 times, here, they're like mini eventide islands from the first game, where you're stripped down to your skivvies and have to forge for weapons and materials to fight your way out. Way more interesting. Some shrines are pretty clear about what the game wants you to do, like a platforming paragliding challenge. Or there's one shrine that is really Literally the ending to Halo 3. There are some exterior shrines which usually involve flying a crystal from one sky island to another, like your Jesse Pinkman making a delivery. 
bitch! These usually lead to Araru's blessing shrine, since the hard part of the shrine was done outside before the shrine. So you walk inside the shrine to get a freebie and- Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> then there's shrines where they put a bunch of crap in the room and go, Alright, get from point A to point B, or get a ball from point A to point B. Puzzle objects in shrines contrast well with the background, like the test chambers and portal. But they could have done a couple of different visual styles instead of the same one for all of them. Some shrines, I could not for the life of me figure out what to do, like the baseball bat one. But others, some people struggle with, but I thought it was really easy. Like the hot air balloon one where the puzzles literally make a hot air balloon. Or the three rails one where I saw a lot of people online struggling, when all you gotta do is build this. But some people, I guess, couldn't figure that out? You know, sometimes I feel kind of dumb, or I'm at my job feeling like, oh, this isn't hard. Anyone could do engineering. Then I watch other people play this game, and I go, you know what, never mind, I'm actually a genius, and there have been many childs left behind. And the thing about these shrines is that some players, me included, would have no idea what the intended solution is and brute force a jank ass solution. But the game doesn't stop you from doing this. The design philosophy of Tears of the Kingdom's puzzles is, if you beat the shrine, then you beat the shrine. How did you beat the shrine? We don't care. Let me tell you, right, let me tell you <laughs> We don't care. Jerry. If you want to skip the intended puzzle and instead use bomb arrows to activate these targets, you can just do that. Game doesn't stop you. Sometimes it feels like it was too easy, or I found an exploit that the designers maybe overlooked, but tears don't give a fuck. <laughs> You can't use any of your stored Zonai capsules and shrines, but if you duct tape a rocket to your shield before walking in, you'd be surprised how many puzzles you can skip. The shrines featuring Zonai devices do a great job of teaching the player ways you can apply them in the rest of the game. I never used the springs before, but after the shrine about springs, I would duct tape two or three springs together for mad vertical. I never thought to use the seeker drones, but after the combat shrine where you manufacture a bunch of minions and have them fight for you, I was deploying more murder drones than a United States president. Vegan clan designs you find are often pretty wacky and pretty booty, which is funny, but they do help inspire players on ways to use different Zonai devices. Alright, I'm about to fight King Dragon, the president of hell, so I spent 20 minutes pre-making a bunch of death devices. And they got destroyed immediately. Wahoo! 10 out of 10! Game of the year! Previous Zelda games. Series of doors that need keys. Use the hookshot to unlock this door. Use bombs here. Use the dominion rod here. Sometimes keys work on multiple doors, and multiple keys can work on the same door, but that was usually the exception. Tears of the Kingdom? It's not a series of doors, it's a series of obstacles, and you gotta MacGyver yourself a doohickey to get past it. Or to put that another way, previous Zelda games were like crossword puzzles. There was a specific answer you have to find. Rarely an alternative word might work, but more often than not, there was one answer. But in Tears of the Kingdom, now we're playing D&D. We gotta carefully consider our entire arsenal of techniques and think of a way to solve the problem. These shrines were much more memorable and satisfying for me, not just because the game is more recent, but because for many of them I had to create my own solution. Dungeon Design This is probably my spiciest take in the video. Dungeons in older Zelda games were my least favorite part of each game. <laughs> Not that I disliked them, but I never looked forward to doing them either. They had a cool mini boss, cool new item, sometimes, and a cool boss fight. But the rest was room checker 3000. Check this room, find a map, check this room, gotta get a key, go back to this room, can't do this yet, go into the other room, move a switch first. To reiterate, I do not dislike Zelda dungeons in previous games. But when I play and replay Zelda games, they're always the, alright, let's get this over with quick so I can get back to the fun part of the game. Some of the ones in Skyward Sword are pretty cool though. I always preferred the running around the overworld part of Zelda games, which is why my favorite Zelda game before Breath of the Wild was Wind Waker. Since you spend less time in the enclosed dungeons and more time exploring all the islands of the Great Sea. Spicier take, I thought the divine beasts were fine. <laughs> Not amazing, but fine. I liked interacting with the beast to change its position. It really made you feel like you were inside the big mechanical zord from Power Rangers. The underwhelming parts were the aesthetically similar designs of each beast's interior and boss fights against forgettable elemental Ganon blobs. Tears of the Kingdom's dungeons are more like divine beasts, but inside a building this time. You and the local sage team up to spit on four or five different terminals marked on the map, then fight a boss, which are all unique this time. You've heard of Molgara? Get ready for 
<laughs> Colgara. While video games are, of course, a couple degrees abstracted from reality, previous Zelda dungeons would be called things like the Fire Temple, the Earth Temple, but never really felt like this is a building that people used. Just an Indiana Jones death trap puzzle box. I never hear anyone mention Breath of the Wild's Hyrule Castle. That was one of the best dungeons in Zelda history, even though you can skip most of it. It clearly functioned as an actual place, but it's in ruins, so it's filled with monsters and you can use all your abilities to navigate it. And the explorative, open-ended dungeon design in Tears was reminiscent of that. And in Tears, they struck a decent balance between feeling like a place that they say they are and each location feeling unique, while also having predefined puzzles to solve. All of my friends were saying that the Fire Temple was really hard, that my black ass was gonna have trouble with the Fire Temple, kinda rude of them, and had I followed the minecart tracks around, then sure, maybe it would've been hard. But again, you can solve it however you want. All you need to do is arrive at each spot. So I used a lot of rocket shield jumps and climbing to get to the hot spots. This was the easiest dungeon for me because it was so open. I'm still not entirely sure how the fuck I was intended to solve this part of the Water Temple, but just like the shrines, a jank ass solution that works is still a valid solution that works. I like how each sage joins you for the dungeon. It reminds me of the Earth Temple and Wind Temple from Wind Waker with Medley and Makar. But in Tears, you ain't gotta worry about transporting your buddy all that much. For the most part, they just teleport to where you need them to be. One thing I rarely hear people talk about is how the events leading up to the dungeon are more fun than the dungeon itself. You bounce and glide from ship to ship with Tulin. You do a Gerudos vs Zombies tower defense with Riju. I don't remember what Sidon's was, but I'm sure it was fine. And you ride a series of fun minecart roller coasters with Unobo, and then fight a big ass lava dragon at the summit. Oh my god, how am I possibly going to defeat that thing? If only there was a fully assembled Zonai jet plane right in front of me as soon as the cutscene ends. Oh, neat. So let me get this straight. I'm somewhere that's not what I would call Hyrule. I'm seeing freaking dragons, and oh yeah, I'm talking to a rock. Y'all know what that sound means. It's pretentious video essay time. After a really long fade to black, why do people do this? I'm legit asking here. I'm not making a point or anything. Over time, video games have always tended to- Hold it! No! You don't need a British accent to make obvious points in video essay format. Society has moved past the need for the British. Accent video essays. It's time for a new era of cowboy video essays. Humanity has always had the innate desire to ascend, to conquer that Y-axis, or Z-axis depending on which way your dangalang swang, or Z-axis if you're a colonizer crumpet. This desire to fly has long reverberated through game design direction as processing power has increased. Zelda 1, flatter than the Great Plains on a Sunday afternoon except for Death Mountain. Zelda 2, Jump Button, Link to the Past, multi-layered dungeons. Link's Awakening, Rock's Feather. Ocarina Time, Third Dimension. Skipping Ahead, Wind Waker. Deku Leaf, Skyward Sword, Flying on that Bird. Breath of the Wild, Climb Anything, Paraglide Anywhere. Of all his gales now ready, Pinnacle of the Kingdom has ascended its ascension to its logical conclusion. Flying machines, skydiving, an entire layer of the map designed to facilitate more vertical gameplay. This game could only work well as a sequel in the same world. It has a good balance of, I don't mind flying across all of Hyrule and skipping a lot of it, and should I choose to go down there, I know I'm gonna find some good stuff. Not essential stuff, but good stuff. I heard a few people say that this game is too big, there's too much stuff to do, I'm simply getting too much value for my money. <sighs> no wonder God has forsaken us. I don't know who needs to hear this, but you control the buttons you press and you do not have to do everything in a video game. Leading up to this game's release, I heard people complaining that, oh no, the Koroks are back, hope I don't need to find 900 of them again. So of course me, the beacon of truth and wisdom, had to break it down for people, explaining, you were never meant to find all 900. The game stops giving you upgrades after finding 
spending half of them and rewards you with literal shit for doing so. They put a lot in the game so that no matter which direction you head in, you would find some along the way. And I was so correct, as usual, that someone even wrote an article about how correct I am all the time. Do they really have to refer to me as Twitter user? I've never been so insulted. The same applies to the rest of the game. You have a lot of options of stuff to do, but it's not the game's fault if your own compulsions make you feel exhausted trying to do all of it. Some of the side quests are cool and fun, but others I simply did not feel like doing, and that's okay. In fact, unless it is your full-time job to 100% video games, I do not recommend that you try to do that with games of this size. You can go fight the final boss at any time. So you do what you want to do, finish the game, watch the credits, and if you want to do more later, you can reload your save. It's easy for some adults to forget, since it was literal adults complaining about it, that games are designed with a broad audience in mind, including kids with infinite free time, but usually cannot buy their own games. We didn't have a lot of money growing up. I got maybe one or two games per year as a kid. I 100%ed GameCube Wind Waker in middle school, which is much more cumbersome than the HD version, but I would not do that now. This game was $70. There better be $70 worth of quests in here, goddamn. The story and perceived lack of continuity. I thought the story was okay. Some people say they like to play Zelda games for the story, and I have to wonder if we've been playing the same games. Zelda games have always been light on story, because when they make them, they cook up a glorious gameplay platter, then sprinkle some story seasoning on top of it. Each one of these games has like two to three major events, and the rest is the ancient prophecy foretold that you will go to these locations and collect three objects. Instead, Zelda stories are more conveyed via sub-quests and sub-text. The same is true for this one. It's really easy to not care about the Zelda timeline when it's obvious that the creators of Zelda do not care about the Zelda timeline. So for those of you who are hoping for Kingdom Tears, 158 shrines divided by two days, yeah, keep looking. The broad stroke story here in Tears is the same as Breath of the Wild. Ancient Ganon evil corrupts ancient technology from ancient civilization. Link wakes up and collects rage powers from four zones. Zelda makes tremendous sacrifices in the past to help Link out in the present, and you learn the real story by finding memories. Here's a question. Why can you find the memories out of order when later memories recap and spoil and are payoffs for the earlier ones? Why not just give you the memories in chronological order regardless of which glyphs you find them from? First glyph you find, memory one. Second glyph, memory two, and so on. In Breath of the Wild, out of order makes sense since it's Link's own memories from that place. But in Tears, that is not the case. It's also fucking stupid how you have to watch what is essentially an identical cutscene four times after you clear each dungeon while Link stands around like a dumbass. I get that the cutscene is more for the sage than for you, but they should have had some new information in each one, like a piece of the original Ganondorf fight, I don't know, instead of still images and the same message four times. Despite this series being called Legend of Zelda, the character is Zelda doesn't always have much to do during the game. Some guy who's incredibly smart and hung and correct all the time already made a critically acclaimed video about it. In Tears of the Kingdom, Zelda does have stuff to do, and you learn about her between game actions by talking to other residents of Hyrule. But like Breath of the Wild, Zelda does most of her stuff before the events of the game. It's a downside inherent to having such freedom of direction. It's hard to tell a linear story, but it would be nice if more of the story happened during the game and not before it. I do like how Link and Zelda, to an extent, parallel Raru and Sonya, and Link and Zelda's situationship is left up to player interpretation. But let's be real, there is one twin bed in that house. They've been fucking raw. In fact, all NPCs have much more agency. They're not just stationary quest givers and exposition vomiters waiting for Link to show up and solve all their problems. They're running around on quests of their own. It makes the world feel much more lived in. There's even a side quest chain where a group of Hyrule warriors go out and fight monsters of Hyrule themselves, and you can team up with them. This is just Xenoblade combat, except this is better. Don't tell the weeaboos I said that though. I know Zelda fans have questionable tastes because everyone was going from 6 to midnight about Pura's new look, but I barely heard a peep about Taro and Sonya. Huh, I wonder why that is.
I've seen many people online complaining about the lack of continuity between Breath and Tears given its direct sequel. Where are the towers? Where are the shrines? Where are the guardians? Where are the divine beasts? Why don't characters remember you? You are the hero who saved Hyrule. I'll explain as much as I can. I mean, the out of story reason is so that Tears can tell its own story. And so if anyone starts with Tears and wants to go back and play Breath, they can still experience unique stuff. They don't for sure say how many years have passed between the events of each game, but I'll say that given Breath came out in 2017 and Tears was planned for 2022 before it got delayed, I'll say it's roughly been 5 years to match it with the real world releases. Link and Zelda don't look like they've aged much at all, maybe because being 20 years old while also being 120 years old mess with their bodies' natural aging. Many characters do remember you or recognize you. For example, everyone in Lookout Landing knows who you are as soon as you arrive. You, a man, is allowed in Gerudo Town because Bulliar remembers you. Blonde? No abs? Not a vi? You may pass. There's a big gay statue of Link riding Sidon like a jet ski from the previous game, but they still made sure to include the Mipha statue. Terrytown and Madison exist because of you, but the random shopkeeper you met five years ago? Yeah, sorry, they don't remember you. Events from half a decade ago? They're not gonna be brought up all the time when it's not relevant. It is implied that Link lived in Hateno Village between games, and not everyone in Hateno acts like they know him, but like, do you know every single one of your neighbors? I certainly don't. But isn't Link like a famous person? He saved Hyrule. They ain't got internet. They just got a newspaper last Tuesday. Zelda built the first school. And most people affected by the calamity were killed by the calamity. And then 100 years passed. And most people on the outskirts lived their lives. How often do we bring up World War I in daily conversation, you know? But Link defeated Calamity Ganon in Hyrule Field. You mean that place where nobody lives? Link wasn't streaming his final battle. To people in the outskirts like Hateno Village, it was that day when the sky turned red for two minutes then turned back. A regular occurrence in this Hyrule. What about all the Sheikah technology? Guardians explode when you kill them. Plus at the end of Breath of the Wild, they did imply that all the Sheikah tech was powering down. Probably because the calamity was eviscerated. So they probably got rid of all of it. Like throwing out your old gateway PC running Windows 95 that doesn't boot up anymore. And it looks like they salvaged what they could and recycled it for the Skyview Towers and Pura Pad. Sure, Zella is the princess and Link is her bodyguard, but I don't think anyone recognizes her authority, including her. Hyrule is a kingdom clearly on the decline. They're all just trying to move on. Look, I have played multiple sequels where all they do is go, hey, remember this thing from the previous game for like the whole game and it fucking sucks. I promise you, barely acknowledging the events of the previous this game is the much better alternative. Maybe they're saving Divine Beast explanation for DLC, or they're not mentioning it because they're not relevant to this game at all. But I will say it is a little weird how, as far as I know, there's no explanation of the connection between Calamity Ganon and Ganondorf. They don't even call it Calamity Ganon anymore, just the Calamity. I don't know why they didn't just have him like skeet out a little puddle of malice when he was originally sealed, and over time that grew into the pig beastie, I don't know. Here's a question for Zelda historians and theorists. Is there a connection between the Zonai robots and the desert robots from Skyward Sword? Someone who's not me should make a video on that. Here's another question. The Purapad has a camera function. Zelda takes pictures with the Purapad at the start of the game. You can see those pictures in your Purapad. Instead of just hoping that her plan works somehow, why didn't Zelda to the past simply write down a message for Link of exactly what to do, take a picture of it with the Purapad, and then she gives it to the robot, who then gives it to Link at the start of the game? Is she stupid? Valid criticisms. Moderate gameplay spoilers here. A Nintendo published game with questionable UX decisions? What? That's never happened. For example, you know how you can eat from the pause menu? Why can't you fuse weapons and items in your inventory together in the pause menu? I shouldn't be running around trying to gorilla glue a diamond to the master sword during the final boss battle, you know? In Breath of the Wild, you could pick different arrow types and use those in a row. How come in Tears of the Kingdom, I can't make a bunch of special 
special arrows in advance. Instead of having to select the item individually every single time you want to shoot one special arrow. In Wild Wild Breast, you beat each Divine Beast, you get a champion power-up that is easy to activate. In King's Dumbass Tears, each Sage follows you around during the dungeon and you run up to them to activate their special ability. This makes sense during the dungeon, but after the dungeon, you get a hologram buddy and they sort of help you fight and by that I mean Tulin hits 360 no scope headshots and the rest stand around. You have to run up to the Sage to activate their ability, which isn't too bad if you have just one or two, but by the time it's four or five, it's kind of a mess and I accidentally do it all the time when I'm just trying to pick up items. Tulin's ability is Horizontal Revali's Gale, which is really useful and shows up while flying. Why aren't the other abilities also context sensitive like this? Riju powers up your arrows with lightning, but she fights enemies close up with her swords. So if I want to activate her lightning arrows during combat, I have to run up to her near the enemy, turn it on, run back, then shoot a single arrow. Who designed this? Why isn't Riju an arrow command and Yunobo a throw command and Sidon a shield command? And why is Sidon's ability fucking useless? The only one this makes sense for is the Zonai Mecha Sage that you can hop on and ride. But it happens so late in the game that at this point, players can build a much better mecha at a Zonai Tech if they wanted to. I never used it. The rain is still complete fucking horse shit. There's a new ability to reduce slip during the rain and it barely works. It does nothing. It's a complete scam. Is this some kind of twisted joke? Any sort of modern accessibility options are nowhere to be found. Way to go Nintendo, really raising the bar. The controls can be a lot. Like a lot of pressing and holding multiple buttons while also using a stick. Motion controls do help though. Mayhaps you inferior humans who cannot see the apple in your head and rotate it will struggle with these building controls. But for me, an adept genius who has experience with 3D modeling software. Yeah, no, it still took a lot of getting used to. This will not be a smooth experience for players who have limited experience with 3D games. Thesis and evolution. You see, Breath of Wild, right? That was like Beyonce's song, Flawless. Extremely good song and slightly experimental, but still very much a Beyonce song. And Tears of the Kingdom is like the Flawless Remix. It builds upon the foundation laid by the original. The second one could not exist without the original having been done first. But the second elevates the song's status by the most surefire way known to man, by adding Mickey Minjaj. Also, the games aren't flawless, that's just the first song that came to mind. So which game is better, the foundation or the elevation? Uh... Who cares? What we have here is a classic, holy shit, two kicks scenario. Two awesome once in a generation games that are absolutely worth playing. I've seen some of the way y'all gamers act. Y'all don't deserve either of these. Each Zelda iteration has always innovated in some regard with things like a wolf or a boat or a bird. But this game doesn't just iterate or innovate, it elevates the original's ideas. But you couldn't get to the elevation without that first iteration plus six years of marination. It's the next evolution of the Zelda series, which may scare some people. Evolution has a history of scaring some people. Religion is bad, but the key essence that makes it a Zelda game is still more than present. This game is good, but I still prefer the old Zelda. You have the right to that opinion. Look, Breath of the Wild is not a perfect game, and neither is Tears of the Kingdom, and there are plenty of valid criticism to levy against both games, but overall, most people who played it really liked it. But the few people who did not like it, uh, never shut the hell up about it and will let you know every chance they get that they did not like this new direction. And I feel for these people and their lack of taste. I really do, trust me. I know what it's like to feel abandoned, almost betrayed by an entry in a series that you've been playing for a long time. But for this very small percentage of players, let me ask you a question, and I really want you to think about it before answering. Do you really miss Small Key Simulator? Or do you miss the way video games made you feel as a child? Do you really miss Room Checker 97? Or do you miss not having to pay taxes and change diapers and shit? Um, it's a good game, but not a good Zelda game. 
I'm going to punt a fucking kitten. Okay, so not only is this opinion very funny, but also wrong since these games are styled around the openness of the original Zelda games. But let me ask you this. What makes a Zelda game a Zelda game? Is it about the formula that had grown tired after five repeat times? Or is it about the sense of adventure and wonder you get from playing the game? Tears of the Kingdom is a game that lets players fully immerse themselves in their own creativity, and the challenge with creating a game that allows for creativity is that some players are not creative. You know, I saw this dumbass tweet a few weeks ago about how Animal Crossing Switch was a scam because the island felt so barren. You make the sandwich! But yeah, some people are not creative and they do not want to be creative. They don't want to think. They want to go down the grassy hallway, occasionally go down a side hallway and find a heart piece. And don't get me wrong, I enjoy linear, smaller scope games with well-curated content for the player to experience. But in the new games, you still go from point A to point B, but you get to choose how to get there and there's gonna be cool stuff along the way no matter which way you go and if nothing else you can still walk down the grassy hallway if that's what you prefer there are paths on the map follow the paths they lead you directly to the main objectives do you miss traditional style dungeons well isn't a dungeon just like a series of puzzle rooms and the satisfaction of doing the dungeon comes from solving the puzzles well there's actually more total dungeon than ever before they're just spread out for better pacing hop in do the puzzles hop out keep exploring instead of the game and the dungeons being arranged like this now they're arranged like this traditional style dungeons you know what else used to be tradition slavery and if you're still not convinced do you still want to go back to the past? Well, there are plenty of quality, modern games that take heavy inspiration from both 2D and 3D Zelda. In some of those games, you might not be playing as a little white boy anymore, so that one guy who had a problem with so many dark-skinned Hylians in this game, he, uh, he, he may not enjoy those cups of tea. What a fucking loser. But given that Zelda is such an influential series, there are plenty of quality options out there to help you scratch that itch. So I say, enjoy the game now before in six months to a year, or when all the internet think pieces come out telling you that it was bad actually. Wait, they're already here, aren't they? Final score, despite everything I've said previously, I give this game a 0 out of 10 because not only can you still not pet any of the doggies in this game, they removed Wolf Link and scanning his amiibo just lets you eat him? What the fuck? Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe. I'm obviously just one person and this video only reflects my opinion. So comment below with how you felt about Keyers of the Kingdom if you've played it. But don't forget, today's comment code word is LEGOS. Comment LEGOS if you made it all the way through the video. And uh, that's it, video's over.